feature presentation. Okay. You, well, that's a hell of a, a, a collection you got behind you, Matt. Well, thank you. Thank you, Matt. I really appreciate that. It's it's actually funny because I, I brought out one um, collection in particular because I was thinking about like how to start this conversation off. You know, right. it is uh, National Canadian Film Day. I could ask you, you know, what uh, what's your definition of a Canadian film? And do you see this movie as being a Canadian movie or speaking, um, you know, to an international audience? But I wanted to start off with, uh, in your opinion, what is the best piece of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle merchandise? And I specifically brought this out uh because i was thinking about this while watching blackberry so <laughs> look there's been i other than pokemon you it probably is one of the largest toy franchises that exists certainly in the 90s it was the biggest uh okay okay i'll try what i think the stuff that i think is the best is the stuff in the film like that's why i got it also, yeah one that for me i was like oh yeah this is really really great i have it hold on all right oh this is gonna be really good the build up whoa so i remember when i was just a kid the original turtle blimp like this is a, <laughs> this is an inbox uh, of it like uh, so i won't i won't i won't crack it but the original um uh turtle blimp which you see in the film this is hanging above doug's uh desk right was i mean it's a bit flimsy and you got to fill it up yourself and and the turtles just hang from it like it's a bit silly in a lot of ways but but this blew my mind when i was uh when i was a kid and i was like i can't believe that you can have a toy like that this and and then the, the pizza van but but they put out so much good stuff i think a lot of those um the figures that that uh that came based on the cartoon were really revolutionary but, but due to the fact that they put out like like thousands of them um but but if i had to pick one it's that it's the blimp for sure for sure but even now like i like these new editions of uh the original henson the 89 movie re-release of the figures i think those are also great like yeah uh, i i really really like those I, well, I, it has the CanCon connection as well with Elias Kateas, right? As Casey Jones, who no, might be one of the best. I'll tell you a little secret. I'll tell you a little secret. Elias was the first person I went to for the for the role that originally went to that eventually went to Michael Ironside. Oh, and, and I begged him, I begged him, and uh, he wouldn't do it because I wanted Elias to be the guy who breaks up movie night right before Doug <laughs> shows up with the Ninja Turtle movie. And I was like, oh my God, this is going to be so cool. Like, this would be the coolest thing in the world. Like to have Elias be the person who's like, fuck you, Doug, because he is notorious for hating the Ninja Turtles. He thinks that that movie is way beneath him, like a waste of his time. He never wanted to talk about it. He hated it, hated it. And so I thought, ah, this is perfect. Like I'll cast a guy to castigate Doug for watching Ninja Turtles and it will be the person who himself was in it and hated it. But of course, you know. I mean, Michael that. Ironside's amazing in the Yes, film. of course, look, 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 look. It was, it was, I got to make the Verhoeven connection instead. In, yeah. in a way, I thought maybe I'll have Doug drop up at the office with RoboCop um, or or maybe even like Starship Troopers or something. And because because Michael was, was notoriously going to play RoboCop but they couldn't fit him into the suit. Um, but I thought, ah, maybe that's a bit too, quaint and i really should stick with ninja turtles because it has all these other connections to the film etc cetera, etc cetera. absolutely I, well i appreciate you sharing that with me and uh if elias kateas is watching or listening to this he's wrong uh he's great in the movie and oh, he's uh, amazing he might, he's, he's, he's incredible he's the heart of the film he's the heart of the film he also has uh, some of the only like sincere comic beats he's taking it so seriously he grounds the movie oh i love it I love Absolutely. It. Yeah. Um, so I so I wanted to make a connection though to this as, as well because I was curious to know. Um, did you see did, did you see a lot of yourself in Doug uh, Freegan as as a fan, or did you incorporate stuff that was more from your childhood, or did you have any um, references or connections to him as a person that might uh, implement some of of these um, you know pop culture icons and characters? Yeah, I would say it was a mix of both because obviously I. Um... I was trying to make a point about sci-fi nerds. Like I wanted to basically show that, you know, a movie obsession, media obsession, people obsessed with Ninja Turtles, this type of stuff or Carpenter movies, that it wasn't a useless pastime, that in fact, they wind up taking 
the things that are interesting about this science fiction and turning them into integrated products, right? Like there's, it's no, it's no coincidence that the guys who invent the first smartphone were all obsessed with Star Trek, right? Like, like the film is trying to, however subtly make that point through Doug. And so, so having him have those specific obsessions was really, really important to me and specifically games. There's a lot of like video game references in the film, a, a lot of references to like ID software and like like early land party culture. And and that I also thought was was really, really important for, for showcasing not only what Canada was like in the 90s, because it really very much was like that, um, but what like university culture at a place like Waterloo was like. It was almost like not a fraternity, obviously, but like a kind of pack of engineering guys who figured out how to hook their computers together and play video games that were very min maxing like all about math etc like 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 command and conquer or early warcraft were and to show that there's a direct line between that and people who would make these types of devices so your your question was about where the references came from and i yeah. get more of the why but but the the connection to the real doug i i i know precious little about the guy other than that he's a huge movie fan and really loved uh, a lot of the Steven Spielberg, Indiana Jones franchise. Um, he and Mike, that was their favorite movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And so- and Which is in the film, yeah. Yeah, we pay homage to that. Um, and then it was only like passing reference to, to other properties. I know they really, really like Star Trek a lot, like a lot, a lot. And that that was a major touchstone for them. But most of the information I got about the culture, because I never talked to these guys in real life, I got from ex-engineers, people who were there in the 90s. Um, and so they were the people who sort of filled in what what they liked. Do you think that frees you in a way, though, as well, in terms of shaping the narrative? And and there, again, watching this movie, what I really love about it is there is a docudrama style to mm. the film. And I know a lot of people have been and probably will continue to compare it to the social network. Obviously, it kind of started this chain reaction and trend in sort of looking at specific, you know, mom moments in culture and, and items kind of changing the world that we live in. Um, but I wanted to ask you how films like F for Fake and The War Room and movies mm -hmm. like that helped kind of create the style or influence you in, in some way. Well, look, we stole the whole aesthetic specifically from that Penny Baker film. And that was that we wanted to try to make, what's so great about that Clinton doc is that sometimes the subjects feel the camera in the room and sometimes they don't. And what, what Jared and I discovered is that the further away we put our cameras from the performers, the more lost they could get in the moment and the more open they would be to improvising and letting things just happen as they were. And this became specifically important when we were shooting with rooms full of actual engineers, because it is very difficult. I'll give you some examples. Early in the film, you see a lot of like the guys like typing in chat rooms or playing video games, like these young engineers who are actually, those are all Toronto filmmakers, but to get them to behave that way, you really needed to put the camera far away and not let them know it was rolling because otherwise you were just never gonna get that type of behavior. And that we really stole from Penny Baker. In terms of F for Fake, Orson does this too. There's a great sequence at the beginning of the film where he has Oya walking down the street in, is it Italy? I don't remember, maybe it's the South of France, in front of men. And he secretly records the men's reaction to her walking down the street, I think in a bathing suit. And he narrates this and it's a kind of, you know, citizen cinema, where you're watching real people just being themselves, almost embarrassing themselves with their lascivious gazes at, uh, at his then wife, uh, maybe then girlfriend, not sure. And, um, and that is something obviously in all my work I'm stealing from constantly. I love putting real people in movies, but specifically real people who don't know that they're in a close up because that that to me, movies don't do that enough of that. And, to, and that's what I love. So, I mean, you clearly know that those are major touchstones for this film, but you could go back even a little bit uh, more like there's a, there's a Sondheim doc by Penny Baker called Company, which yes. is about, so you know it. Yeah, that was yep. another one where we stole a lot, specifically how they do the zooms in that. It's like the decision of when to zoom. We were really, really like, trying to play with because this isn't like Nirvana the band it's not like our our other work where we're like the zooms are kind of a joke 
like we zoom as, as comedy. Here we were thinking, hmm, I guess the operators are zooming only when they feel like something is only going to happen once or where it's like they can't believe it. And so we were a lot more, well, limited and, and a little bit more disciplined in how we were we were zooming and our lenses were so long like they were like 500 millimeters with a doubler on and so you could to zoom that quickly would be like you'd be moving through about like eight inches of prism in order to do that and uh it would look insane if we did it and so we tried to we tried to keep our references on the penny baker national geographic animal photography side and not to our normal references which is a lot more like uh, haxel wexler uh, medium, yeah, medium cool, medium cool craziness, you know, yeah. just like blah, 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 which is what which is what we normally do. But uh, this one we tried to calm it down quite a bit. Yeah, well, well, again, like there's another guy that kind of does something similar with the more comedic side of things. And I think of someone like Sean Baker, who kind of like, you know, has strategic zooms that are played more yeah, for, yeah, yeah. for comedy. But he also has a docudrama kind of approach to the Very film. Very similar. And we watched Red Rocket and uh, his uh, motel movie in prep for this. And, uh, and again, like he's, he's the king of other than the Safety brothers of like true street casting, like having people being themselves. I, I personally find uh, like, like when it doesn't work, it really, really, really doesn't work. Like some of those performances, especially in that motel movie, I'm like, oh my God, this is awful. But when it's great, my God, is it ever great. And he's got a beautiful aesthetic, especially with how, how few lights he uses. We really, really tried to steal a lot from him in that because so much of his stuff is natural light or one source or like two practical sources and that's it and jared was like we're basically trying to do the same thing we use like different cameras but very 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 uh inspired by yeah the florida project is just such a beautiful naturalistic kind of looking awesome. movie and then harmony crin's another guy that you think of as well in terms of using you know local sort of actors or people that are non-actors and incorporating them into the narrative. I, I was curious about the shooting style as well. Does it change your, your approach to how um, you sort of adapt with getting coverage or, 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 or sort of working well, with coverage? Have you heard me talk about this before? Because it seems almost loaded. Like, like uh, yeah. It, it is. I, it is. I listened to a couple of podcasts and I know that you talk about um, a found technique yeah, uh, well, look, that's that's my that's that's my central philosophy that that I kind of developed with with Jay McCarroll, uh, who I make Nirvana the band with, and who is on set with me every day. And it's that we are constantly striving for a found look as opposed to a placed look, and that is very important to me because I I I detest, I hate stand up comedy, right? I, I I and I hate it not because I hate stand up comedians. I think when it's done well, it's 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 art. It's incredible. I can't believe it. But what I hate is the idea of somebody telling me the same joke that they told yesterday, because it has a kind of fakeness to it where I go, oh, this is just an act. Like I'm just watching a persona. Like there's nothing real to this. Now the great comedians make it seem as though they, they, they've never told this before. And I really do love that. But with film, in some ways, you bring up the social network is, is a perfect counterpoint to it because Fincher is the absolute master at the place everything is perfectly placed and it's so perfectly placed that it's it's unassailable like he he knows exactly what he wants the audience to be seeing he's like he was he's hitchcocking in that way i mean he really is the modern hitchcock like he doesn't make any mistakes ever and you're watching and you're just you truly are in the hands of the master and and uh, uh, there's a place for that and i think that in many ways like it, it, there's it, it's uh well as i said look he's the master but I, what I'm trying to do in many ways is the exact opposite, which is I'm trying to find things that could never have been placed. Michel Gondry has got a great line in his documentary called Block Party. And it's uh, a, a, a group phone call meeting that he has with Chappelle and Questlove and basically their entire team. And he's describing how he wants the bands to play because it's coming together quite quickly this live street show and the bands are saying well we're not going to have a lot of rehearsal it's not we're not going to be perfect and michelle says yes but you know we will get something even better than perfect because you will not have everything right like we will do something better than perfect and i think it's quest lover somebody who says i got no idea what you're talking about like that doesn't make any sense and to me that is the essence of what i'm trying to put on camera something that is so like flawed and chaotic in a way that it transcends what the perfect version of this same 
thing could be because you could never write and plan for it to be the way that it actually is, which has a certain level of, I mean, Werner Herzog calls it the ecstatic truth. It's like, it's like something that is more real than what reality displayed perfectly would be. And yeah, I think about like even something like melancholia. There's a moment where where John Hurt is talking about these spoons in his pocket, and it wasn't a scene that was scripted, but it was very much. It's yeah, just example. yeah, and 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 with that, like you're just the way that you're talking about it describes this movie so perfectly. I have to wrap with you, but I did want to ask one last question, and that is, do you see Jim Balsilli as an antagonist in this story, or do you see him just as a part of the corporate machine, or the 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 idea of someone being a part of uh, innovation in the process of it all? Look, my opinion is that all three of these central figures, Mike, Doug, and Jim, are completely and totally essential to having an imbalance humor. And I don't mean humor in the comedy sense, I'm talking about like the Greek humors of personality, like, like to have a working individual or a working organization. I, I don't see Jim as an antagonist to anybody other than Doug, which he is quite literally. In fact, he's, he's, he's demonic in a way, like Doug doesn't understand anything that he's doing and thinks that the world would be better off if there were no Jims. And of course, Jim feels the exact same way about Doug. And they're both wrong, right? Like Doug is a moron for not realizing that without Jim, they don't get to hang out and play video games and watch movies and do amazing things without him. And Jim is an idiot for putting political pressure on Mike to then out Doug from the company and destroying that culture, because that inevitably winds up eroding the entire heart of the organization, which invented the Blackberry in the first place. Like these people need one another. And it's almost like a right versus left politics. Like you, the idea that one wants to completely get rid of the other is to a normal thinking person insanity. Like you can't. Have you need one. balance. Yeah, absolutely. And so in many ways, this film was me trying to figure out these these tensions within myself, because while I'm certain anybody who like doesn't really know me and watches this film would be like, oh, well, that's Matt Johnson just playing himself. But all my friends watch this movie and they're like, oh, wow, Jesus, you really put yourself on screen with that gym guy. Yeah. Like, like that, that really is what I'm like. Well, it, it does feel like, like Jim and Doug are fighting for Mike's soul in a weird way, the back Literally. and forth between the two. So there, there is that as well, which I think adds another layer to the storytelling that is very compelling. Um, again, I have to wrap with you. I could probably talk another 20 minutes or so. Just as on could this I, Eric, again, like I, I find it so um, pleasant and edifying speaking with cinephiles such as yourself. And in, in no small way, it is the reason that I make these films the way that I do, because I am a lot... I am that person who thinks that in movies, there is a kind of secret magic that uh, is difficult to explain. And I'm the person at parties being like, no, you don't get it. This movie is really, it's crazy. You gotta watch it. You gotta watch this movie close up. It's, and then people watch it and they're just like, this fucking sucks. What's wrong with you? <laughs> or you show people F for fake and you're like, isn't this the funniest thing ever? And they're like, no, this is stupid. So I, I have a deep sympathy for all people who love cinema and uh, I too could have this conversation carry on forever. I hope that at some point we get to meet in real life. Do you live in Toronto? I, I do. I, well, I live in Durham, uh, the Durham region, which is just I, about yeah, 45 minutes outside of, of Toronto. But I'm also supposed to interview you again on Friday with Perfect. Jay and Glenn. So I look forward to continuing the conversation, especially because um, this that interview will be for Rogers. So I've got some questions <laughs> about uh, one reference oh, in particular. Yes. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ted, Ted and Jim were, were, were arch enemies. I tried to allude to that briefly in the film yeah. where Jim is trying to big man him. But uh, I'll tell you something, that group conversation will not be anything like this, my friend. Those, right. guys, those guys are not, uh, not that they don't know a lot about movies, they certainly do, but it'll be a different tone. Yes. But again, again, you know, it's it's different formats, different styles. So you have to, you know, respect that. But at the same time, Matt Johnson, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Oh, please. It was a total pleasure. Goodbye, Eric. All right. Bye, Matt.